Hey everyone, so this is a script I originally wrote in June of 2021. A few weeks ago I got on the high of re-watching old anime movies. After watching a good number of them and throwing my academic and social life out the window, I realised I really wanted to do a video on, well, one of them. I only did two videos on your name, one being my first video ever and the other one being... Hey, that's the third act, it's Amori. Come on kids, I'll take you there, it's all I'm good for anyway. That? I've already done an academic essay looking at Ghost in the Shell and the Netflix Death Note movie which will be getting a video in its own right, and Ghibli movies are well known for being very generous with copyright. And then I remembered that I had written a script for Perfect Blue almost a year ago now. I dug it out and I realised two things immediately. Number one, it wasn't actually done. And number two, I had written the script as an impulse and nothing else. I hadn't really thrown any sort of thought behind it either. And also number three, there is no third point. So, this video is an amalgamation of my initial thoughts and feelings after seeing the movie the first time, and also actual research into the film, its themes, and so on and so forth. This will probably be a thing I do more of, because the bridging takes a long time and I've spent over 11 months now trying to get Dio and Jonathan to fight without me burning out every 5 minutes. So, enjoy! Like I said, this is going to be a more regular thing. You can tell I'm not really doing this with a script, this intro bit, because I keep doing this. But yeah, enjoy. I watched Perfect Blue recently. Oh! You broke your Satoshi see, Kon okay, see, I'm, I'm, see, I'm proud okay. of you, I'm proud of you. Unlike Gone, right, where if we bring up a show that you're like, yeah, you should watch it, Gone's gonna be like... You know, <laughs> it was amazing. Like, it was... It, I feel like it's, it, again, like you said, it's so relevant this time, and I think yeah. anyone can... T I think it's more relevant now than it was almost when it came out. I, I want your mouth. I want your eyes. You project all these qualities onto me. You don't know me. Perfect Blue is one of the most relevant movies that I have seen in a long time. And that's all I can really see on this film as an uh, impulse. Despite it being released 25 years ago, the themes and ideas that director Satoshi Kon showed in his debut film are still very much relevant today. Let me elaborate. The film revolves around ex-pop idol Mima Karyoge as she goes from singing to acting. During her first acting job, a pretty Japanese crime drama, she's stalked by her past idol self, and also an actual stalker. She starts questioning reality as people around her begin to die in gruesome ways, and her acting career becomes darker, harsher, and more sexualized. There's a lot to take in in an 80 minute movie. I want to break it down into a few segments, talk about what really sits with me, and everything else really. That's right, I'm an actress. One of the things I find hard to do in movies is to connect with characters. It's like an uncanny valley effect. I know they're the main characters of the movie, but I, on some level, don't care. I'm watching a movie, these people aren't real, they're played by actors who go home and are probably in a pedophile ring. There are only a handful of movies where I emotionally connect to a character, and one of these characters is Mima. She's real, well, not actually real, she's animated, Ugh, you get what I mean. Is that rumor really true? What, the one about Mima? Uh-huh, that's what everyone's Fanzines, saying. 400 mm. yen, jam, fanzines, three left, only three left. All right, people, it looks like they're ready. So without further ado, please welcome to our stage, Cham! Mima was first shown as a pop idol, a figure above all. Her audience chant for her like she's a god, the fucking stalker holds her in his hand as she dances. When fans start fighting, she's the perfect voice of reason, getting them all to stop before anyone's really hurt. No, no, you don't count, fuck off. But those glamour shots are also intercut with the mundane. Mima the idol sings a chorus to a crowd of cheering onlookers, but Mima the person gets milk and food from the store. She, the idol, is greeted by an army of fans as she's given love letters. She, the person, travels on the train home to her cramped apartment in a tower block, far from the idyllic glamour of Mima, the idol. She has real problems. Her parents aren't the happiest with her new acting job. She's bossed around by people who don't have her best interests at heart. Her past self comes to life and torments her every day and night as her mind crumbles and she can't tell reality from fiction. Well, okay, maybe that's stretching normal problems, but let's... Let's, let's move on. One of the things that really stuck with me were a lot of cuts and shots from the film. They're really abrupt and they give this jolting feeling that I really, really enjoyed. 
One of the ones that probably sat with me was this cut from Idol to Real Life. She's given one of hundreds of fan letters from the day from this massive crowd and one fan yells, I'm always watching Mima's room! It's like a switch being flicked and I sat there for minutes after still reeling from that shot. It was something that I found really cool. One of my favourite things in film is what the professionals call the He's right there you dumbass shot. It's one of the reasons I like films such as Halloween so much. You have a character pop out at you from a crowd, the lighting and composition of the shot tells you that they're trouble and nothing happens. They just stand there. And this happens a few times throughout the film, and it adds to this haunting dread as Mima's reality crumbles. Is she imagining this stalker? Is he really there, or is he just a face in the crowd that she saw at her last pop idol gig? Is the stalker a ghost of her past, similar to the visions of a pop idol self that she sees throughout the film, calling her back to where she's most comfortable? I mean, we learn by the end that yes, he's a stalker, and yes, the visions of her past are, for the most part, just visions, but yeah. But the way that the stalker is presented is in a way where you can't tell what's real and what's false. Throughout the film there are little segments where it's Mima waking up from what is apparently a dream, but then realising that something's still wrong. She wakes up one day and she's in the middle of filming a shoot, looks over, the stalker's there, she blinks and he's gone. It's a technique I really like and it's this haunting uncomfortable, unnerving feeling that you get while watching it that I really, really like. If I could film horror movies, which I've tried in the past, I definitely want to do something like that. Don't try to find my horror films, they're not very good. Craig Norris, who is a scholar who did a paper on Perfect Blue's representation of fans, stated that the effectiveness of Perfect Blue as a psychological thriller is largely due to the narrative style that blurs the real from fictional. Mr. Romania, thank you very much. You're the only one I can depend on. The idea of Mima's inability to distinguish fiction from reality goes further, showing a similar but extreme issue with the stalker, Mimania, and Mima's agent, Rumi. I think that Mania and Rumi embody two extremes of fandom. Mania is, as his online name suggests, a Mima maniac. He's infatuated with the idol that was once Cham's lead singer. Once Mima's acting career takes off and things get to the point I can't show them on YouTube, he lashes out, he gets angry, and it resorts to him trying to kill and do other stuff to Mima at the film's climax. Nora states both Mimania and Rumi represent a relationship with popular culture and idols which expresses the dangers posed by identification. Within Perfect Blue, this process of identification is literally expressed by Rumi and Mimania's attachment to Mima, the ultimate violence. You don't have to worry. A pop idol is always protected by her fans. They always listen to any favour that I, Mima, ask them. Rumi and Mimania represent fan identity as a neurotic sickness. The representation of the dangerous and deviant fan typically evokes more panic in the wider community and popular press. This stereotype of the isolated fan that is driven to kill as a basis in media coverage of deranged fans and stalkers who have murdered famous people. More recently, in 2019, a Japanese idol was stalked by a fan using a reflection of a train station in the idol's eye from a selfie she had posted on social media. There's a massive problem of idols getting assaulted in Japan by fans, and the fact that Perfect Blue, a 25-year-old film, is still relevant today for this reason is... haunting. I'm no psychologist, so I won't make claims about mental health. I'm a YouTuber who makes Jojo a bridge, for God's sake. However, the obsessiveness of Rumi in particular stands out to me as a force of nature. She brutally kills anyone that destroys the larger-than-life picture she has of Mima as a pure and pristine figure of beauty. One of the more haunting images of the film is what she does to the photographer that takes nude photos of Mima for a magazine. The film lets us in on the idea that the killer of Morano, the photographer, is someone hiding behind the image of the pop idol Mima. Likewise, the murder of the photographer Morano includes a number of cuts to a mask, suggesting to the audience that the Mima seen committing this murder may be in fact be a mask worn by the real murderer. 
However, Satoshi Kon didn't make Perfect Blue as a criticism of fans and fan culture, as I originally believed. I had written the majority of this Essien script on the idea that this was the case, that Satoshi Kon wanted to comment on the weird obsessiveness that Japan's idol fans have on their idols, leading them to attack, stalk, and often kill their idols. In an interview from 2002, Satoshi Kon states, No, the film is not based on any criticism. I simply wanted to show off the process of a mature young girl who is becoming confused because her old value image is broken into pieces, but who will be reborn as a mature human being as a result of that. That's what I wanted to describe. But because I had to stick with the idea of an idol, the film came to talk about that particular world. It seems that one of the main themes of Perfect Blue wasn't the interactions of fans and idols, but the idea of dreams within dreams, the idea of reality becoming an illusion. In the same interview, Khan said, The idea of a film within a film, and the idea of a blurred border between the real world and imagination, those were my ideas. So it appears the film has become a scrutiny of fan slash idol relationships without actually being about that. The negative fan focus of Perfect Blue was merely a theme, a way of spotlighting the Japanese entertainment industry. Khan did have an idea to focus on the fan idol relationship, which he carried over to his next film, Millennium Actress in which a reclusive actress recounts her life as a prominent film star for an out-of-business studio. However, instead of showing a negative portrayal of fans, Millennium Actress strives to show the opposite. Khan says in that same interview, I had intended to make two films like Sisters, through portraying the relationship between an admirer and an idol. So, in this relationship adaption, I wanted to do Millennium Actress in a completeness, full of opposites, more positive images. In this direction, both films are very important to me, because they represent the dark side and the bright side in the same relationship. Perfect Blue is a terrifying look at what a fanbase is capable of, despite it not actually setting out to be about that. But the continued assault on idols by fans, the new age of internet celebrities, has kept this film relevant since its initial release in the 90s. If my video has done anything, I hope it's encouraged you to watch this film for yourself. Just be sure not to do what I did and watch it with your parents. It gets very awkward very quickly once you get to the strip club scene. No, I'm the real thing. Look who survived this time in hell, Brando. Joestar. Hey, Vince! 